It's Comics Great, the visual storytelling show recorded live every other Wednesday at the Ann Arbor District Library in lovely downtown Ann Arbor, Michigan, comics.aadl.org. This is the show where uh, I and a bunch of other cartoonists sit around and talk about uh, comics, making comics, comics lifestyle, what it takes to be a cartoonist, and also what it takes to uh, be an advocate for comics. All the people who support this industry that we're, or this medium that we uh, love so much. And we have a returning guest this week. This guy right here, uh, Sidekicks, uh, the author of Sidekicks himself, Mr. Dan Santat of Dantat.com. Hello. Hey, Dan. Hi, Spirit Fingers. <laughs> Good to see you again. Uh, you haven't been on since episode, I think, 49 or something like that when yes. we talked about fear. Yes, I've been, I've, been, uh, I've been busy raising kids. This summer was insane. You, it's you, a crazy you, summer. They have my, I take my kids to a summer camp. And it's a half hour away from this house. So it takes me an hour to take them to summer kids, summer camp, and an hour to go pick them up. <laughs> so, Two hours of my day. But wait a minute. You're in California, so a uh, half hour away is what, like seven and a half miles? Yeah, miles? yeah, yeah. It's really, yeah. When you factor in traffic, yeah. It's really, yeah, it's really seven miles away. But for some reason, it took me a half hour to get there. <laughs> I'm not kidding. I am not kidding. Uh, I, I, I believe you. And, and uh, also, I, I want to I give some shout-outs to some places where people can find you real quick. Uh, if people, for those six people who haven't heard of you, uh, you're at dantat.com, dsantat on Twitter, and uh, dsantat on Instagram, where you can see some awesome photos that you take of your workday and also when your iPod is overheating because it's been yes. 145 degrees outside uh, in your neck of the woods. Uh, but yeah, I mean, you, you do a lot of books. Let's just really quickly introduce people to your oeuvre. Uh, let's see, Three Ninja Pigs, uh, Nanny Piggins and the Wicked Plan, Sidekicks, as I mentioned, and there's a trailer on YouTube that people can check out for Sidekicks. Great comic, so much fun. Uh, also, Dog in Charge, I understand that that got a Caldecott. No, no, no. That was, it, was so, it, was at, it was at the printers, and uh, oh. an art director for another publisher had a stack of them, and he just stuck it on there and took oh, a picture. Oh, I, got I could only wish. That was, <laughs> that's how that would be great. How rumors would get started, like you know, hey, I, I think that won the Caldecott. It sure did. <laughs> <laughs> or if it put you on the radar of the Caldecott, people like maybe we should give this one a Caldecott. Right. Lots of people yeah, it looks kind of good on that cover, <laughs> right? Uh, but yeah, you also recently updated your site to um, a Tumblr site. So yes. Dan, Dan, dantat.com now takes you to Tumblr. It's a really cool looking site. Uh, I'm wondering what was the idea behind switching to that? Like, why, why, so, why not do like a dedicated WordPress installation or TypePad? I, I hate blogging. Like, I've gotten to the point where, because I used to say that I would make a commitment to blog one post every Tuesday. And then when that Tuesday would come, uh, what am I going to talk about? You know, and I found myself just saying everything I wanted to say on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. Yeah. So I just said, well, why don't I just make my website kind of this organic stream of everything? You know, if, if, I'm, at, if I'm at a book event, I don't need to hoard all these photos and then wait for Tuesday to come and upload and spell check and make sure that, you know, I'm saying something meaningful for people to come back every week. It's, why don't you just drop in and see where I'm at? It might be a picture of me literally eating a bowl of cereal. <laughs> <laughs> My favorite ones that are, they're back in the feed a little bit, but you did all these photo manipulations of you throwing yourself into the air. There's one of you sitting yeah. next to your son in the kitchen, and your head is just gigantic. Uh, it, it, was this just like some Photoshopery that you were doing, or is there like some kind of filter on your iPhone that does this? Yeah, so um, I, I did that all in Photoshop. I, it was like a 20 minute exercise I would do every day. And uh, part, of, part of the decision to do it was. Uh, you know, when I do school visits, you know, a lot of the time you talk about what your life, what your daily life is like as a, a children's book author and illustrator and maker of comics. And so I wanted to, I wanted to make up this kind of Willy Wonka kind of lifestyle where people think, oh my gosh, you know, how, how does he get all this work done? <laughs> and then they look at this feed and they say, oh, he made a clone of himself. <laughs> so the clone answers the emails. The clone, you know, he, he blocks in the colors to all the artwork. I get it. That's how he does all that stuff. And, you know, I went to go. This is actually a true story. This is funny. Um, so I was doing that series uh, of, of my clone series. 
And uh, there was a librarian in Pennsylvania who thought, hey, that'd be great. Why don't we have him come out and speak to the kids? And uh, this was like just outside Lancaster. And okay. I could go out there. What, what age group? The- what age group are you talking to? Oh, gosh. It was like... It was supposed to be for this entire elementary school. I don't even remember the elementary school. This was like two years ago. Um, but, they, yeah, they, I was supposed to go to two different schools. And uh, I go out there and I speak to the first group of kids. It was like kindergarten through second grade or something like that. And I start and I'm talking about how I make books. And then I start going into the whole, oh, yeah, and then I made a clone of myself, you know. And all the kids were like. <laughs> oh my gosh is that real like it freaked them out a little bit it freaked them out a little bit and so um, like in the middle of the presentation I was just like I'm just kidding I'm this, <laughs> this really didn't happen and they they wouldn't buy it like they started looking at me like is this guy really is this guy really a clone they're, they're all Mel Gibson and conspiracy theory right <laughs> Uh, and so afterwards, afterwards, I remember, like, I think it was the principal came up to me and was just thinking, like, I thought we were supposed to do, you know, supposed to do some kind of wholesome presentation on how books were made. And I said, I was just doing something fun for the kids. You guys called me. You guys, this is on my site. You know this is there. And uh, they said, well, why don't we not do that for the next presentation? <laughs> really, throughout the rest of the day, there was, like, this awkward feeling of... I just felt like I was getting glared at the whole time while I was doing the presentation. And then I guess they informed the other school and the other school said, well, why don't we just forget it and we'll just send him home a day early. Oh and I'm like, gosh. okay. So. Wow. So, so that you said, I'll see you guys next time with the ventriloquist dummy and the clown. <laughs> <laughs> so that was weird. Um, that's not the real... <laughs> I still like to do the series, and I, I'm sticking to my guns with it, you know. Uh, I thought it was hysterical. There wasn't anything terrifying about it. Yeah. Hey, I guess there's some people in the world that just think, you know, someone's trying to pull a fast one on children. And, you know, I think they missed the point. Yeah, yeah. I, I think most kids are smart enough to understand that you can't really clone yourself and make a tiny version of yourself who does your work. Yeah. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm planning on... I'm planning on um, I'm planning on firing it up again pretty soon, but uh, I just have so many projects on my plate right now. I'm, I'm, I'm having a hard time even to spend that 20 minutes just taking a photo outside and, and photoshopping stuff together. Uh, I have a dog now, so I have to walk the dog. It's a border collie. Oh, gosh. So it's just constantly running all the time. Exercise. Yeah. So much. <laughs> and so, yeah, it's like a 40-minute walk. Along with taking my kids to camp an hour in the morning. And like all of a sudden, my eight hour day has compressed. Now I can only get like, if I'm lucky, three hours of work. Of uninterrupted work, yeah. 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 Oh. And that's, that's kind of what has propelled me to streamline my life to making everything more efficient, but not compromise quality. I think that that's a really awesome point to bring up about blogging is that, yeah, go back five years and when it was like, well, I got to take the photos off of this digital camera, put them on Flickr and then grab the right ones, put them in the blog post, put them, you know, with an image tag and then I got to write some cogent thoughts that actually feel like that it was worth the visit. Man, oh man, Mm -hmm. a Tumblr site just seems like such a great way to just funnel everything into one place, right? Or or, I actually do the majority of it on my phone now. So if I take a picture... I put it on Instagram. I give it this really awesome 1970s filter so it makes me look all sophisticated. And for some reason, Instagram, like whenever you can never take a bad photo with Instagram. Suddenly, you know, a picture of a waffle is like, oh, my gosh, this is amazing. Um, but, I'll, you know, I'll take a picture and I'll, and I'll say what I want to say. Like, I, you know, I just got this into a gallery show. And the great thing about it is that I can put it on Facebook, I can put it on Twitter and Instagram, all in one shot. And I've said my piece. And I figure if I ever want to do like a meaningful blog post, I can. But I don't have to incorporate like tons of words and stuff. Like, I mean, I, tons of photos talking about things. Like, I'm I'm about to um, I'm about to do a blog post actually on the Tumblr. Um, I just judged uh, the original art show. Uh, at the Society of Illustrators a couple weeks ago, 
Wow, congratulations. Yeah, and so uh, for, for people who don't know, the original art show is the, is the annual competition where um, they get all the publishers to submit their best picture books, and then they judge on what they think were the best uh, picture books illustrated that year. So I was like one of seven judges, but there was something really, uh, I don't know what to say, like life-changing about the experience. Um, when you look at all the books, I mean, I, we judged over 550 books. And I, I have to say, I, I've only seen maybe 10% of those books on actual bookshelves. And it's kind of, it's kind of scary because you think, well, what happened to the other 90%? Like, where do they go? I didn't see this book until I came into this room and I judged this competition. And you're flipping through the books and you're looking through things, and you realize, and I think this goes back to the whole discussion I had earlier in the last episode about style and about finding your style, mm-hmm. is that I think there's a lot of people that are, are still trying to kind of, I think they're trying too hard. I feel like there's a lot of people who are still trying too hard. Like they're trying to get, they're trying to have some kind of hook, some kind of, angle to their artwork that makes them stand out, you know, and and when they get to the point where they're trying too hard, then it feels gimmicky. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, I think it's, it's, uh, let me throw this at you, see if you agree with this. Uh, It's it's a lot like when you're in high school and you start trying on identities, like you have that friend who suddenly becomes goth, or you have that friend who suddenly is like, oh, I'm I'm into Hendrix and I'm into wearing like a tie dye and my hair is like really messy now. And it's like, what happened to you, dude? Yesterday you were all into Legos with me and now you're like this, you know, because you try on different identities and and when you try it on, you're like way into it. And then eventually after trying on these different identities, you start to figure out, well, it's, I'm a little bit of this and a little bit of that after all. And then you start to mellow out. And then you become sort of, well, the ideal is you become a real person. I think it's, I see that happening similarly with uh, artist styles as well. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, like for me, I guess somewhere in my 20s, I just stopped caring what people thought. <laughs> you know? Um, no, but really, you know, coming up with your own style comes down to just, I was doing I was doing a lecture I was doing a lecture at a at a college here a couple couple weeks ago, uh, and and the topic of style came up, and really it's 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 about getting away from all the influences that you have like stop looking at you know that artist that you love to copy and draw because the more you look at it the more you're gonna draw like that person, mm-hmm. uh, which is why you know I keep a sketchbook and then um, I'll just. I'll just draw a little image on each page whenever I can without any, without any ideas of, you know, how anybody else would express the artwork. Mm -hmm. And it's it's really kind of helped me flex my own muscle on how I like to, how, how I like to interpret things. And that's really, that's really how, what it comes down to is just to, just to trust your own instincts, you know, and just do your own thing and, and not worry if, what I find is a lot of people worry about whether or not it'll sell. Mm. Can't make money out of this. So be- believing in your own instinct is the way to find the thing that might sell, rather than trying to. It really know. is. Yeah. It really is. You have to kind of you kind of have to believe in yourself in order for other people to believe in you. Yeah. Yeah. You know? yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, again, going back to high school, it's like when you're trying on an identity and you're trying too hard to impress some girl because, oh, she'd like it if I wore this kind of jacket, you know? And then that that just, that reeks of desperation, right? I was, yeah. She's really cute, and she likes, she likes bunnies. (laughs) I'm going to bring in a trapper keeper full of bunnies. You like bunnies too? Hey, I like bunnies. Oh, that was that was why I started wearing acid wash jeans. Was you know, it's like she likes that guy with the acid wash jeans, and I don't like them, but I'll put them on for her. You know, so my priorities were different as a child. It was, <laughs> hey, ladies, I just got my driver's license. So, okay, we had an exchange on Twitter recently that inspired. Uh, I, I said I got to get Dan on the show to talk about this. Uh, I was saying something to the effect of. Um, Thumbnailing Thumb- being oh I'm getting some slap back from you Dan if you could I don't know if you could just back away from the camera a little bit there we go there okay. okay. maybe maybe it's, it's my sound is bouncing off of your che- your big manly chest there we go all right hello 
<laughs> All right, so I, I was Your talking word about... giving me a rash. <laughs> Gotta put some Vicks Vapor Rub on this afterwards. <laughs> but I was talking on Twitter about how I was uh, thumbnailing and uh, how it's the most challenging and grueling part, but also the most satisfying part of making comics. And you just responded with, I'm, I'm with you, brother. Uh, and so I realized that, you know, I don't get to talk about thumbnailing enough and on, on this show. And I wanted to frame this discussion real quick. And then I wanted to do some comparisons about how we do our thumbnailing. Because in my opinion, thumbnailing is where we really do the work of a cartoonist, uh, of, a, of a visual storyteller. Because what are we doing when we're thumbnailing? We're not worried about drawing it perfect. What we're doing is worrying about panel size, panel composition, page composition, acting moments, viewing angles, balloon spotting, dialogue, pacing. We're making all those decisions on the fly and writing a story often, right? Uh, on the fly, on the piece of paper. Uh, and then when we get to the drawing part, it's like all that stuff's been figured out. All we're doing is just drawing it well or as well as we can, right? So thumbnailing is where the real, you know, macho work of making comics happens, in my opinion. Yeah, absolutely. That's where all the design happens, for me, at least. What do you mean design? Um, okay, so when I was doing, side, <laughs> when I was doing Sidekicks, the, uh, it was the first comic I ever did. So there was this overwhelming feeling of where do I start? There's so many things you need to know, you know, the pacing. Uh, the framing, uh, you know, the consistency of characters and environments. Um, it was just really overwhelming considering that, you know, here my editor said, well, let's, let's, shoot, for, let's shoot for 250 pages and then uh, we'll go from there. And, and that, was, that was also the tough part. How do you take an entire story and hit that mark, hit that 250 pages? Yeah. And he let me loose because he never, he never, he had never done a graphic novel either. And so the, the best way for me to jump into it was just, was just to make it. And in my very first draft, I actually drew the comic and did all the word balloons and all the text all at once. And by the end of it, <laughs> it was, <laughs> by the end of it, it was 500 pages. Oh my God. And it and this is while I was working full time at a at a video game company, and it had taken <laughs> it had taken me one one year to do the first draft of this comic, and I you know literally it was like it was <laughs> it was that thick, you know I put it in a big FedEx pack and I threw it out the door, and then my editor got back to me with notes and and he he said you know well first of all. You have to cut this in half. And second of all, you know, I got to page 30, 40, and I got bored. <laughs> said, oh, no. Oh, that's good. <laughs> you know? and, uh, and, and he said, well, okay, so consider cutting it in half, and let's, let's, try, to, uh, let's try to refine the story a little bit. Um, and my editor... Arthur Levine, he was busy doing Harry Potter books. He was doing Harry Potter 6 and Harry Potter 7. So um, shortly after a while, he got so overwhelmed with that entire series that he actually handed the reins off to uh, his, uh, one of his editors, who was a good friend of mine. Uh, her name is Rachel Griffiths. Uh, and she and I worked on this graphic novel. And I just, I, starting over, I, I just decided, you know what? It's just going to be easier for me to streamline this and compartmentalize everything uh, in 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 small segments. And you know, I don't I don't know how graphic novels and comics are done in the comics world sense, but uh, in in children's and picture books and uh, middle grade novels, they're very they're very um, they're very comfortable with with text. Mm -hmm. And so um, when, I, when I did the new draft of the graphic novel, the first thing I turned into her was just an outline of what happens. And, you know, I gave, you know, full details of, oh, well, he, you know, he picks this up because, you know, it means this. Um, you know, he says this. Highlighting the big ideas, like the thematic components of the story in the outline? I yeah. The whole idea of the story. And so the outline ended up being like 22, 28 pages. But I knocked that out in like, I knocked that out in like a month. 
and it and it saves so much time. Like, um, and that really was it. You know, with with doing the graphic novel, what ended up happening was that I had the full time job. I was illustrating other books. Uh, I had the cartoon show, and um, you're talking about the replacements, by the way. And you know. It became. It almost became like an excuse not to work on the graphic novel because graphic novel, man. You want to do a graphic novel, you have to, you have to really invest your life into it. Like I, after doing a graphic novel, and I remember, I remember, uh, I remember when I was done. Like I, I wrote a blog post about it, and I said, "This honestly feels like the equivalent of climbing a mountain." <laughs> not, not everybody. Climb Mount Everest, but the people who have gotten to the top, they are out there and they can be proud of themselves. You know, not everyone says, you know, oh, well, good for you, you climb Mount Everest, you know. Um, but those who those who decide to do the journey and get to the end of it, it's, it's a very self-fulfilling kind of experience, if anything. Like now, I get a picture book job. I get a picture book job, and someone says, "Oh yeah, we need we need this book done in in six months." And it's like thirty two pages. <laughs> All right, you just call me a month before the book is due, and I'll get it done. Huh? You, know? <laughs> you know, nothing intimidates me anymore. Now that I've done one graphic novel, yeah, yeah, and and the whole process. So the process. So the book was signed. The book was signed in two thousand two. And then I really didn't sit down to start working on it until 2010. Oh wow! Oh. Why? Why the, why it, the long pause? Um. Again, like I said, like the editor was busy with Harry Potter's, and then I was busy with the hundreds of jobs I was working on. Yeah. yeah. And it almost became this intimidating, daunting thing that was looming like like the expectations of it were getting higher and higher in my head and uh, I, I, I just kept worrying that uh, oh my god this book's not going to be any good it's taken me five years and I hadn't done anything I did that first 500 page draft and it was like I got I got bored after page 40 <laughs> and you know knowing how much work it took just to do that first draft I, I think it just got me really intimidated in uh <laughs> just taking another stab at it, which was another reason why um, I, compartment I compartmentalized my duties. And really, it was, I, I mean, for doing a graphic novel, I have to say half the battle is just knocking down that outline, just getting it down perfect and rock solid, um, getting that main skeleton of the story down. Yeah. And then once you get that outline done, then I script it like a movie script you know he says this he says this this is the scene here this happens um and, and a lot of it was i have to say if it wasn't for the, the tv show like i learned a tremendous amount from the tv show and uh, I, I, that's how i basically approached it i i approached the graphic novel like we were doing an episode of the replacements okay. um you know you write the script you break it up in little sections and then you storyboard it out um, and, and I guess, I guess the way to describe it was, uh, I wasn't designing graphic novel pages in a page by page sense, but I was actually designing the graphic novel in a frame by frame sense as if I was watching a movie. Okay. So, so like here I have an example, I have the script here where all the characters say their lines, but then I'll break, I'll break off a line of text and then I'll just draw a little thumbnail sketch there, yeah, of what yeah. was said in that particular sequence. And so what I'm left with is hundreds and hundreds of these little storyboard frames. But that made designing the pages a lot easier, and it made pacing a lot easier, because then I could say, "All right, I need." I need this action sequence to exist on this page, and I need this frame to end it because that would be a great page turn. And so I could look at my thumbnails, and I could say, "Okay, I can use four. I can use four of these frames for this page." Uh, and it. And you might look at it and say, "You know, 
this frame might actually not be necessary because it just it just adds more it just it just makes it redundant or you know I could really use one more frame to to design the page to make it even more rock solid right right so it's 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 these sketches that you show these are like pre viz sketches these are not highly detailed sketches like what are like what are the like, if you could isolate what are the concerns you're really worried about at that stage that like only I can understand these. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, are, are, what are you thinking about when you're thinking about, like, staging these shots? Like, uh, what, what, what are your primary concerns of capturing in, in capturing those little tiny, you know, sketches, thumbnails? Um, it depends. Like, I, for me, first and foremost, is the narrative. Um, when I was in art school... When I was in art school, uh, I took a storyboarding class, and one of the things that they made us do was sit down and watch Alfred Hitchcock movies, okay, and and just and just storyboard the whole thing while we were watching it, and then you would study it. Like drawing, it's actually drawing the movie while you're watching it. You learn a tremendous amount. You don't realize that you're learning anything. Like your hands understand what they're learning, but it takes a couple weeks for your brain to catch up. And okay. so you're drawing these frames and then like <laughs> it's almost like it's very it's very like karate kid, very Mr. Miyagi. Like, I was going to say that's exactly you? what I thought was Mr. Miyagi was like sand the floor, right? <laughs> all this. Why am I drawing all these? He doesn't like me, you know? <laughs> A couple of weeks later you're looking at them and it just makes sense like, "Oh, well, that's why that's why that happened." And seriously, it's this weird thing where your hands do the exercise, but your brain learns. I don't know. I don't know how it works, but <laughs> for all those listeners out there, for all those people watching, gosh, storyboard a Hitchcock film, you're going to learn a tremendous amount, and you're not going to know it until <laughs> two, three weeks later. That is a really yeah. neat idea. So, like, just, like, sitting down with Hitchcock and speed drawing while, like, the, the movie's playing like uh, what anytime a scene jumps out at you and even if you don't know why it jumps out at you like it's like oh that's well that's a weird scene and then just grabbing it really quick right it was like we were watching Citizen Kane and you know he's really good at staging dramatic you know visuals so you know oh the shot upwards with the lighting you know with the lighting to make him look really menacing yeah. um and that's really the best education I, I had so with the graphic novel I handled it the same way you know Oh, in this particular scene, he says this, so it has to be a tense scene. So I have to do what I remembered from, you know, <laughs> Hitchcocking. You know? <laughs> Hitchcocking. <laughs> you heard it here first, folks. Dan Santek coined the term. From now on, that's what we're all calling it. I'm going to go Hitchcocking this weekend. So um, there's, there's, uh, that was that was a thing that I learned because when I went back to my old 500 page draft, I realized that I, I really savored, and maybe it's maybe it's from all the years of me reading manga, but you know, like I would take these quiet moments, and then I wouldn't realize that these quiet moments were like eight pages long of him like picking a flower, just like pick up the flower, <laughs> I would just sit there and be like, oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> Like, you realize when you're in the middle of it, when you're trying to make a comic, I think if you're in the moment, you know, maybe you really are feeling the emotions of said scene of picking the flower and you just don't want it to end. But when you outline a story and you board it out, you realize you can have the same impact in just a few frames. Mm -hmm. <laughs> But at the same time, you're eliminating <laughs> you're eliminating all the excess stuff that you don't need. Or even or even the context of other panels, right? Is like if you just make it a longer panel next to a bunch of smaller panels, that's going to have the emphasis of that hanging moment that you're shooting for without using eight pages. What's funny about the process you're describing is something that, and it's it's funny that this came out of working in cartoons, animation, and uh, in and and the children's book world, the trade publishing world. Is this is something I tripped upon sort of on my own by accident, just out of sheer. I, when I started a graphic novel years ago, I 
I had failed so many times to do a long story. I really blew it so many times that I said, I'm not letting this happen again. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to jersey proof this. And so I did an outline which highlighted the key thematic ideas, like a paragraph for each chapter. This is like the big idea of what happens in this chapter and where it ends to lead into the next chapter. From there, I wrote out um, a sort of a, not really a, a script like you were talking about, but more of a, a two-page summary of the entire graphic novel with details explaining the key motivations of the characters. This is why this guy is doing this. This is why this guy is doing that. And then I go in from there. And I mean, here's like, I can hold up for the camera. I don't know if anybody can see this. Let me see. I'll like do all these little notes in the sides with the sketches. Like, okay, well, this is the big idea that this, th why this character acts this way with a signature pose of the character acting that way. But then I'll go in and I'll do these really tiny, I mean, you can see how big these are. This is like a whole page of art with like just basic dialogue, um, not, not even like really refined dialogue, but just the, the gist of what they're saying. And I've got, I'll, I'll show a spread here. I'm going to put it on the table. Dan, you won't be able to see it very well, but the audience will, um, of piles and piles of notes uh, and with like ed, and I'll let myself go down all these divergent paths with like okay let's see what where the scene is headed and let me find my way through it and then I'll get eight pages in and go this is garbage no and then put a big x over it and then from there I go to a second round of thumbs which I actually put in a little booklet form which is like a, a second like sort of like more detailed refined sketch um, based on with like the final dialogue balloon uh, spotting and everything but but you're right like it's so much to take on at once that you got to compartmentalize it to keep from cracking up under the pressure of trying to do such a big job, right? So, like, coming up with that outline to identify what's the big idea so that you know when you're going astray, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, um, I'm not even concerned about, I'm not even concerned about uh, how tight the sketches look. I just want to get, I just want to get the story down. That's, of those yeah. two years that I, I, I sat down and I really nailed on this project, I'd have to say 75% of that time was getting the story down and thumbnailing and having it really loose. And the last 25% of the time was frantically doing tight pencils and coloring it. Like that, the, the finish is the last part. The finish is the part that really puts it all together. Yeah. 75% of, of getting the story down and the frames just right, that's where all the work is. When, and so, you know, when you're working, took, when you're working right here, like these little sketches, go ahead. Oh, no. I, I, was, I would ask when you're working in that stage, are you just constantly drawing or is there parts where, because like for me, a lot of this stage of thumbnailing is pacing, walking around the studio, wondering, you know, thinking, feeling out the scene, acting out the scene with my body. Or is it something where, you know, you just stay rooted to the desk and focus on that paper to get the thing done? I'm just wondering what your, what your, what your writing day looks like. Um, yeah, like if, if, if I'm working on words, I'm sticking with words. If I'm, if I'm working on, on thumbnails and, and, and visuals, then I'm basically just, you know, it, it's either a writing day or it's, or it's an art day. Okay. Like I, I have a hard time kind of flip-flopping. Well, not exactly. I mean, if it's, if it's a matter of, of dialogue, like speech bubbles and dialogue, like speech, t dialogue will change up to the last second. You know, sometimes I'll reread something and say, that's really corny. <laughs> you know, last week I thought it sounded awesome. Today, not so much. <laughs> 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 say it ain't so, Dan, and, not you. Yeah, so I take all the energy from these sketches and I literally scan, the, I scan these tiny little things in and I blow them up to like 200%. Wow. And then I make this horribly archaic, <laughs> horribly crude... blown up version of it oh wow only i can understand yet again and it's really like there there's a picture of manny <laughs> he's just boxes yeah and then i don't even put in speech bubbles like i just type i just write the dialogue on top of that so you're doing your sound effects by hand but does it that is the dialogue done on the computer it looks like or, or is it um, but yeah again like I'm just filling in the, the the dialogue, but when I do mine, I like to I like to integrate it into the scene. So sometimes you'll see like maybe a car screeching around the corner, and it'll say screech, you know. But I'll actually have the screech going behind the car. Yeah. Um. 
But yeah, like in terms of designing the page, you know, I have to keep that in mind. Like I have to keep space open for a text bubble. I have to keep, you know, space in mind for onomatopoeia and all that. And it really that's that's what the next step is. Like where am I gonna put all this type from the script? And if I need to move things out over and open it up a little bit more. Um, and I feel bad for my editor because I actually submit this. Oh, wow. That's awesome. But you- submit this and I say, there, take it. <laughs> I hope you choke. <laughs> you know, and so they'll look at it and they'll say, well, it looks like he's holding, uh, I don't know, a fish. No, that's a gun. <laughs> okay. But, um, but I mean, the thing—the thing that you're doing there is you're you're blocking out the narrative part of the story, right? Not you're not making it look beautiful. You're you're really focusing on the storytelling. What's the yeah, character's yeah, emotion? Yeah. How do I frame? Yeah. It? Going back to Citizen Kane, you're talking about framing up your shots, and that's what's important rather than trying to draw it well. And also, I'm imagining you're not spending a lot of time on these so that you can like it. Does, it's not painful to go back and re-edit and rejigger. Like, oh, I need more space for this balloon. I'll just redraw this panel because I only spent like maybe 15, 20 seconds on it, right? Well, once I have it on the computer, that's the great part because um, th- this is the only. This is actually the only stage where I actually work with paper. Wow. Once I scan these loose sketches in, then it's all digital from there. It's all one hundred percent digital from there. Um, what do you because using? if, what, if what? they're telling me, like for example, if there's something wrong with a scene, I'll, I'll I'll notice that it actually creates ripples throughout the rest of the comic. And all of a sudden, you're like, there's a leak here, but it just sprung a leak here, and now I have to fix everything. Yeah. And instead of redrawing it and, you know, putting sticky, sticky notes down and drawing on top of that, I'll say, you know, this frame still works, so I'll copy and paste that and move that aside. And then you, you, you almost, it's almost like Tetris, where you're moving parts around, and then you're putting a new oh, frame man. in. Yeah, this is, this is a thing that I'm reminded of. This, this, they do this in animation and in filmmaking with like the storyboard cards on the wall, right? And they could just re- easily reshift them around. Now, Matt Madden and Jessica Abel of uh, oh, draw, Drawing Words and Writing Pictures, DWRP.com. They're published by First Second. Uh, been on the show before. They have this exercise they do with their students where they have them actually draw their stories on index cards. And I, and I lifted part of the, this lesson in my classes where you draw each panel on an index card either this way or this way, and then you rearrange it to see how the story changes based on that rearrangement. And sometimes using the same moments in a different sequence can make a scary moment feel funny or you know make a uh, funny moment seem tragic, right? Uh, so having that ability to reposition stuff Right, that's not cheating. That's actually super, super helpful in finding what the beating heart of your story is. Right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, the, I, I keep. I actually keep each individual panel in layers, so everything moves around like a puzzle piece. Mm-hmm. Um, and sometimes, yeah, sometimes I'll, I'll do that. Sometimes, if I feel like a certain frame needs to be blown up and be commanded more attention, then I'll just scale it. I'll just scale it, and I'll let the thing get totally horribly pixelated. <laughs> it is. It gets really ugly. And um, and then sometimes if I need to tighten up a scene, if I need to open up a frame, then I'll collapse things. And I won't even bother to re-sketch it. Like, I'll know what was in that sketch, but then all of a sudden, like, everyone's all skinny, and I'll just <laughs> I'll, I'll add another frame in there. And um, really, it's 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 not about it's not about the it's not about it's really selfish. It's not about the the artwork, but it's about the story. But it's only for my sake, you know. Mm-hmm. Like once I'm done with it, I know exactly what's on that page, and I know exactly what it means. And I feel bad because when I turn it into my editor, I don't care if they can understand it. I just hear <laughs> here it in the moment. It's done. In my words, and they use. <laughs> You do this one. Yeah, there we go. I'm out. Again, why it's so important to get that outlining and script stage down perfectly. <laughs> <laughs> so they can interpret your scribbles. Well, I love this idea, though, is like, okay, so, so uh, John O'Ballier, uh, guest, former guest of the show, is in the chat, and he said that uh, early, early on, he said, thumbs are hard for me. I tend to overdo the drawings. And, you know, I think uh, a lot of us, myself included, uh, sometimes will over-render the thumbnails a, because we want to make sure that we got it nailed the first time. Let's go back to something you said earlier about style and trusting yourself and your style, right? You also got to trust yourself that you're going to be able to deliver on the final art. Yes. 
Uh, but then also, I think part of it, I don't know about you, but for me, at least, I've caught myself overdoing my thumbnails because I'm afraid to go on to that next page. You know? I, you're afraid to go on to your next page because you don't want people to look at your thumbnails and say, this guy doesn't draw very well. Like, you don't want to show people, like, your, your weak stuff, right? Yeah, yeah, if that you too. Yeah. People, your thumbnails, it's like, I don't want them to think I suck at doing thumbnails. <laughs> You know, I kind of had that feeling too when I did that 500 page thing. Like, why am I writing? Why am I drawing every leaf in this tree? This is horrible. It's, um, it's like, uh, you know what I like to equate it to? It's like Pictionary. And I think, I think it's almost safe to say that as artists, we are the worst people to play Pictionary with because we don't get, the, <laughs> if you have to draw a car, we don't just draw, you know, a simple shape of a car and wheels. We're drawing the rims, <laughs> right. handles. We're fixated on the window trim. We're putting flames on the doors. Yeah. Like, <laughs> We're drawing three people squished into the back seat. Yeah. You just have to. Uh, that, that's why I think that's kind of why I, I either am engrossed with just a story or the visuals. Because... I know I'm going to get stuck in that mindset where I want to make things perfect. Now, I only get my sketch as detailed as I need to in order to make it clear for the editor to understand. There we go. So it, it might be a matter of if I'm doing a line drawing and there's a character in the foreground, I might tint them a darker color so they look like they're in the foreground. I don't want the editor to look at it and say, why did this guy get really big? Right. He's in the foreground. That's why I tinted him to push you forward in the plane. Don't you um, think don't you think that doing that and and trying to do just enough for an audience to uh to understand it makes you focus on being clear in your storytelling too? I mean, absolutely. I absolutely. Yeah. I I'll, I'll go through it. I'll go through the comic without the text and if I if I can't understand what's going on, then I feel like there's something wrong with the narrative and the illustrations. You know, I remember watching, I remember watching, um, this was in the 80s, and there's that beautiful Spanish opera, Carmen, where it was yeah. about the woman that fell in love with the bullfighter and the soldier. Yeah. But this was some weird, I don't know what channel I was on. I was, I think I was like six years old, and someone had done uh, an anime version of Carmen, the opera, and it was amazing, you know? Like, he's jumping through the air, he's killing this bull, he's landing on the ground, <laughs> and then this bull just falls <laughs> off. Fly. And uh, I didn't understand a word. I didn't understand a word, but I just sat there and I looked at the visuals, and I got the story. And I think, I, I, for some reason, I don't know, there's a part of my brain that remembers that moment of my life. And it's actually, it's actually become a significant part of my life. <laughs> Well, if I can't understand it like anime Carmen, then I've done something wrong. <laughs> that, that's your litmus test. That's awesome. Oh, I am totally jotting that down for the show tease. Uh, anime Carmen. Uh, I, I Googled it the other day to see if anybody else had seen that one moment in time. And apparently I'm completely nuts. <laughs> <laughs> well... Uh, I, I want to get to a couple other things. Uh, we're about to switch over to book recommendations in a second here, but you have a, con or not a contest, but uh, a new book coming out, and you've got, uh, well, it's sort of a contest. Uh, the Kel Gillian's Daredevil Stunt Show book on uh, your site, right? Yeah, so uh, author Michael Buckley, he's a New York Times bestselling author of a great series called The Sisters Grimm. He also did a great uh, series called Nerds, and this is his first picture book. Um, this kind of goes in line with the series that I did uh, with, with Sidekicks where I wanted to do a program uh, to help promote independent bookstores, uh, drum up more business. And, and, and I think part of the problem is that you, know, you go on websites like Amazon and right off the bat, they can already, sh they, they can already like tear off 30% uh, off, the, off the price of the book and you, know, you save a whole bunch on shipping. Um, it just, it's just it's really really convenience has become the biggest enemy for all these mom and pop stores and uh, also the difficulty of globalizing themselves because you can also buy a book from their site online 
but you're not going to get that huge 30% discount. And what I was trying to do was I was trying to close that gap of that 30% discount. What can I do to make up for that and make it worth your time to buy a book from this independent bookstore? So I was trying to do, I was trying to sell extras, you know, like if you get this book for an extra couple dollars, you can get limited edition stickers uh, of the characters in the book. Uh, for an extra, you know, 15 bucks, I will give you a limited edition t-shirt. Um, and, and Abrams, the publisher, was nice enough to print up a whole bunch of uh, Kel Gilligan uh, posters, which are like these. And these were only going to go to uh, bookstores. These were only going to go to bookstores, but they were kind enough to set aside a bunch. Uh, and so I'm just I'm putting those in for like the first 20, 25 people. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, yeah. So uh, again, it was it was just for me to make an effort. Uh, Mrs. Nelson's uh, Toy and Bookshop in Laverne, California. They're a great bookstore. They do a lot of their business through uh, school book fairs, and um, you know I I think we we touched on this a little bit uh, at the uh, at the last episode that you and I had chatted. But you know there's a, there's a Borders Books in in, in Pasadena. Uh, that went out of business, and it's been unoccupied for over a year. And the thing is, is that the building itself is so big that no one's going to lease it out. Right. It's just this dead building. The bees falling off. The windows are shattered. Uh, but what you find is that at the time when it was open, that was a big hub for business. And so now that there's no reason for people to go to that borders, you find all the other smaller businesses next to it starting to fail. And it just slowly turns into like this graveyard of, of buildings for rent. Yeah. And you know, for me, you know, you might you might want to save yourself thirty percent. I understand, you know, times are tough, things can get expensive. Um, for me, I mean, I think this is just more of a sense of community. Like, I just want I just want to help help a business in my community because at the same time. You show your loyalty to them, and they'll show their loyalty back to you, and help promote your books and, and help with your sales of your of your products. But at the same time, you know, like this is a great book, and I just want I want everybody to, you know, go pick it up. I love this idea of you know we've talked on the show before. Aaron Helmerich's here in the studio. We're about to do book recommendations, and we did an episode not just two two ago talking about how why it's important to partner with your library and form a relationship with your library, forming a relationship with your local retailers. It, it gives you, uh, I mean. It's, it's a good thing to do, but then it also comes around to you in the sense that they're going to push hard for you as a local celebrity in their town, right? So it's a really good idea to do this, and it, it, it's, and it has all these uh, – you talk about ripple effects in your, in your thumbnails. Uh, this has a ripple effect in your community. That's, that's awesome. So that's at dantat.com, and the deadline to order is September 15th, uh, and there's the three uh, Daredevil Pack 1, 2, and 3 – uh, a whole bunch of really neat stuff being offered there. So, yeah, go to dantet.com to check that out. And plus, it's a really cool-looking book. You should just get it just for the sake of it. Um, I had one more thing I wanted to plug before we go into book recommendations. Uh, I've got a book recommendation to, to actually kick this one off. So, September 1st is coming up, everybody. September 1st. Uh, and we're calling it Drama Day. Hashtag Drama Day. Raina Telgemeier of GoRaina.com. Yeah, there's the pre-pub copy. Yep. Oh, it, ooh, somebody's got a hardcover. Somebody's got a hardcover. Oh my gosh! Oh, uh, so, uh, but yeah, this book comes. This book, <laughs> I wait, mine's mine's signed by Raina, uh, but but uh, yeah. So this comes out September first. <laughs> this book is amazing. This book is an incredible book. It is not a sequel to Smile. It is a standalone book. It is it is uh, in my opinion, this is one of the books that's going to be talked graphic novels for kids. That's going to be talked about most in 2013. It's an incredible uh, read. I think everybody who just enjoys great comics should get it, uh, especially kids. And so, Raina Telgemeier at GoRaina.com is ha holding a contest for Drama Day on September 1st through September 8th. If you go out and buy the book in the store, or just actually, you know, just go get the book and hold it up. You can cheat if you want to. And just get your picture taken with the book in the bookstore on release day and post it to Twitter, Tumblr, Facebook, uh, wherever you socialize online. And use the hashtag Drama Day. Rain is going to – oh, and you have to post it on her Facebook, uh, public Facebook page. And the, the instructions are all at GoRaina.com. Uh, she's going to randomly select a winner to get uh, – one of the prizes is original uh, Raina Telgemeier art. Uh, she's going to do an original drawing of the characters from drama for you. The second, uh, one of the, the second prize on the list is being a guest on the Comics A Great Show with Raina. So you'll get to meet Raina face-to-face -face on the show. 
And uh, I believe, oh, I forget what the third prize was, but it was it was something awesome. But um, I can go, go to realreina.com. Lunch with David Roman. <laughs> Lunch with Dave Roman. <laughs> Breakfast with Dave, where you can discuss whether or not he's cynical. <laughs> cynical? No, you're not. <laughs> that was that was that was the highlight of uh, of of ALA 2012 for me. Was having breakfast with you too. That was fun. And, and Dave says we're, he's talking about Christmas, and he says like I just love the aesthetic of Christmas. I love snowmen. And Dan turns to Dave and says, "Dude, you can't call yourself cynical and say you love snowmen." <laughs> yeah. like, look at yourself. <laughs> like the movies where like they take the drug addict, they shove him in the face of a glass window and they look at yourself, look at you become. You like Santa Claus. <laughs> And you give them out to friends in the holidays. But the, the third prize on the list is a smile t-shirt of your choice and sizes. So all awesome stuff. And you know what? I mean, just I think it's a good thing to do just to help make this book a, a, a bestseller on day one. It's a great book. You won't be sorry for picking it up. Uh, and that's uh, the Drama Day hashtag. You can follow it on Twitter and on Google+. And it's available at uh, GoRain.com. Also, do some uh, fan art for the, the book. I did. And you should, too. So uh, no matter how... How, what your artistic skill level is, draw a picture of one of the characters and post it to your Tumblr or wherever and then use the Drama Day hashtag. So, oh, we have a trailer. The, the book trailer dropped for drama and we're going to play that real quick. How long is the clip, Matt? You don't know? Okay, well, Matt's going to give me a countdown. We're going we're to play the clip. Dan, you won't be able to see it, but I want the world to see the trailer for the new book, Drama, so you can see for yourselves. Ready? I've always right, here loved the theater, but I figured out pretty fast that I fit in best behind the scenes. Now I'm in charge of set design for my middle school play. It's a dream come true. Except... What? My amazing idea for a prop might be a misfire. The cast and crew aren't exactly getting along. Not to mention, I don't know if I still like the guy I thought I liked. And I'm not sure if the guy I think I like likes me. Talk about drama. Well, that's pretty cool, right? I mean, look, look at what the, the Scholastic is doing for their right. authors by creating these awesome animated trailers. I mean, Ma Dan, you you make some pretty awesome trailers for your stuff too. You did a really kick butt one for uh, Sidekicks, <laughs> where you were. <laughs> it, since it was like my second book coming out, I really wanted to, I wanted to lead with a, a good, you know, a good charge. And uh, I don't know, I don't know how much book trailers help. You know, a lot of us have that discussion, but I. For me, I like doing them. It's just a fun hobby, so I'll do. I do them anyway. They but it's always a questionable thing of whether they help or not. For that, I think, gosh, I think the I think the first trailer I put on had like five thousand hits before the book even even went out. So wow. I think I think it did something. <laughs> you at least abused some people for a while, yeah, but, but it's still selling really well. So you know, I'm 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 happy about that. I gotta th I gotta think that it has to help if you do something that's really entertaining or fun to watch, and then it just it's that whole brand awareness thing that that the marketing nozzles talk about, right? So yeah, but uh, but uh, okay, so it's time for to talk about book recommendations. Uh, so and I'll put links to all these contests and and uh, sales in the show notes uh, for this episode, which will be at comicsgreatcom slash cag 62 But now we have Aaron Helmrich here of the Ann Arbor District Library, aadl.org, comics.aadl.org. Hey, Aaron. Hello, how's it thanks. going? Yeah, thanks for sticking around while while Dan and I chewed the fat no for a little bit. It's fun. Oh, uh, cool. Uh, so, what do, what do you got to talk well, about today? Well, I'm just on the first book that you guys talked about. I won't go on about it. I will say, coming from my pop culture world, um, the first thing that came to mind, I'm almost halfway through with this book, is if I've got Glee kids, this is a book to recommend to them. Oh, is, my you know, gosh, If I'm looking yeah. for a tie-in for especially kids that don't like to read a lot and watch a lot of TV, um, it, it was interesting how it kind of dovetailed. And can't wait to finish it. So. Yeah, it's so good. And it will be on our shelves at the library um, in time for the release date. This I just grabbed, um, Stick Odyssey, book one, an epic doodle. Um, it's a hilarious take on Greek mythology using a stick figure. Oh. So for all the kids that are obsessed with Percy Jackson. I see barfing. Yeah, <laughs> anything like that. Um, you know, I, I've, I sort of grabbed what is most popular at the moment. So this one has been circling a lot in the kids' department um, by Christopher Ford. Um, so if you want to have like a simplified version of, of uh, your Greek mythology. And then I had to grab um, 
The Three Stooges has actually been circling pretty well. It's from Paper Cuts. Really? Um, and the kids, you know, these the right audience went to go see that movie that was out for about two seconds. So these are old comics. Yeah. These are reprints. Yeah, so this is a reprint um, with a nice new shiny cover on it. Here, you want to see this, Dan? Have you seen this from Paper Cuts? Yeah. I got I got a I got a book from Paper Cuts. They did some great stuff. Yeah, no, they do. They're a good um, company for children's stuff and reissues and things like that. The binding is very nice. Yeah, <laughs> it will last. <laughs> yes, there were people talking on Twitter after your episode uh, where they're saying like, "Oh, you know what? That's something that just doesn't get on our radar all the time. Is that binding counts because yeah. the library's going to spend money on it this. Does. They want it to circ. So yeah, that that baby will probably go out and and uh, be well loved, but still make it. Who did the art on this? Uh, let's see, Pete Al Alvarado uh, and Norman Maurer. Uh, but yeah, this looks like it's like from the fifties mm -hmm. or sixties. Three Stooges <coughs> comics, cool. Yeah, from Paper Cuts. Paper Cuts is doing some really neat stuff no, lately. So. They do. That's it for my book recommendations. I did just want to um, call out locally, or you know, folks that are just paying attention to what we do programming wise. This coming Wednesday, the 29th, um, at 7 here at the Downtown Library, mm -hmm. um, creating new R comics with Sean Martinbro. And um, I think it's going to be awesome. Um, talking what? about a different... Um, what time is it again? It's going to be from 7 to 8.30 next okay. Wednesday, the 29th. And, you know, his, most of his work, DMZ and Thief of Thieves... Um, and then How to Draw New Art Comics is one of the ones. Right. So he's going to be talking about his whole career, how he got into what he was doing, graphic novels, novelist, and how he approaches his art. So mm -hmm. I think that's going to be a good one um, for our local audience. Oh, for sure, yeah. And uh, Drawing the scary stuff, the, uh, the, the creepy uh, noir uh, yes. uh, hopelessness, the you bleakness, gotta learn how alpha fill. Fur coats on ladies. Yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, a different change of pace from some of my workshops at yeah. the Ann Arbor District Library. So, yeah, folks should come out for that. This guy's a pro, and he's going to be bringing the goods, and that's uh, uh, next Wednesday. Wednesday at Wednesday. 7 o'clock at the Downtown Library. I've got some other events that I wanted to plug, and then, Dan, if you've got any events, you can plug them, too. Uh, we've got the Comics Artist Forum, September 9th, with James An Jim Anderson of Ellie, of Pl uh, Ellie on Planet X com. So, uh, I got a couple things that are... <laughs> this one's funny. Um, I'm going to be in a parade this Saturday, everybody, if you want to come out to Chelsea. <laughs> so uh, a while back, I did this comic for a nonprofit organization in Chelsea, Michigan called Seriously, and I came, came up with a superhero universe called Captain Seriously and the Supermaster Sentinels. Uh, Lighthearted, Saturday morning-style action-adventure stuff. I was really going for like a 1987 Sunbow Cartoons color palette with this. <laughs> uh <laughs> It was so much fun to work on. It was one of those jobs where I was like, I can't believe they're paying me for this. And then they let me know that, oh, we're going to have a float in the Chelsea Fair Parade uh, on Saturday the 25th. And the float is going to be designed after the base wow. of the good guys and bad guys from this book. And the kids are going to be cosplaying as the characters. That's awesome. And they're like, do you want to be a part of this? And I was like, what? Do I even need to think about this? No, of course <laughs> I want to. I want to sit on a float made out of my world with kids <laughs> dancing around as my characters. That's great. Yeah, I mean, and one of the characters, my favorite character in the story is Dame Lady Cat, who is, uh, you probably can't see her on camera. Uh, she's a little cat with, who dresses like Mary Poppins, uh, but she's a ninja. And I can't wait to see how they get the kids uh, dialed up for that. But So that's, if you're going to be in Chelsea uh, the 25th of August, you can see me there. And then also I'm going to be at the Small Press Expo in Bethesda, Maryland, spexpo.com, the 15th and 16th of September. Uh, with a bunch of other cool people, and uh, you know, I'm hosting the Ignatz Awards uh, this year, which is kind of a big deal, kind of a, uh, kind of an honor, right? Nice. So, I'll try to do our people proud. But uh, yeah. anyway, so where are you going to be, Dan? You're going to be all over the map too, man. Uh, yeah. So let's see. I think September 15th, I'll be speaking in San Antonio, Texas, for the Society of Children's Book Writers and Illustrators. Uh, I'll be giving a keynote speech about book publishing. Um, the 25th. Um, I'm going to be speaking at Occidental College uh, with uh, Pseudonymous Bosch. I don't know if you're familiar yeah. with his, his work. Yeah, he's, he's actually teaching the course, and he's having me in as a guest lecturer. Um, uh, the, uh, uh, I want to say, uh, I'm forgetting the date on this. It's in September, the West Hollywood Book Festival to promote sidekicks. That's, that's me. No, oh. <laughs> just follow the website, and I'll, I'll I'll get the specific dates, and I'm sure I'll make it public. I just on the top of my head, I can't remember. But, sure. Uh, uh, other than that, yeah, I think I think I'm just gonna be 
burying away at my current book projects. <laughs> so, uh, well, awesome. So I, I wonder if there's any final words, give you a chance for any final thoughts on this whole thumbnailing jazz, like any, any big takeaway to give to anybody who's just starting to dive into a graphic novel project and like, well, what should I be thinking about when I'm thumbnailing? Uh, start small, start, start small, do a short story, do like an eight page story and then, and then grow from that. Like if you can handle the small stuff, and, and then work from that, but make sure that the story is is first and foremost. I mean, look at Diary Kid. It's all stick figures, but you know it communicates really well, and that's all that really needs to. You know, you can do stick figure, stick figure comics. I mean, really, Harvey Picard kind of started that way until he found oh, I don't know, Robert Crumb to help draw his stuff. You know, <laughs> but you know, th that's that's all it really that's all it really is. You know, just to start with. A short story and and just go from beginning to end and stick with it and and I think finishing the, again it's climbing the mountain it's getting to that end and realizing that you can do it that'll encourage you to do more yeah that's a big one is playing that mental trick on yourself to be able to do it again because as you said it's climbing a mountain man and afterwards it's really easy to fall into the oh I'm not doing that again man that was that was rough so you need to have like little thresholds to say like, hey, I'm still okay. I'm still in the game so that you can take on the big jobs again, right? Because yeah. uh, we're only human after all. Well, but well, like, maybe except for you, Dan. Uh, I, you, there's something more than human about you. I, we didn't even get to talk about when you were at ALA and, and this is how, what a big deal you are in the, the kids lit circles. Is they, what did they bring? Like a, a Humvee with a pool in the back or something to take you to dinner? Oh, with Dave Marina, yeah. We were in the back of this uh, red scholastic Hummer. It was amazing. And then we had to go to this restaurant. Again, this is Southern California. So was literally four miles away <laughs> but it took us an hour to get there because the restaurant was right across the street from uh from a baseball game the angels were playing and so it was just wall-to-wall -wall traffic but we weren't complaining because we were in a red we were in a red hummer like in the back where i guess there would be a jacuzzi normally yeah. <laughs> they, had, they had seating and it was it was so cool so I have pictures of it somewhere, and you know I look fondly on it sometimes. <laughs> Dave, there's Raina. Yeah, that was that was uh, the star treatment you guys got that night. That was pretty awesome to see. So, yep, there's that. That's why you folks should listen to Dan Santat and follow him on the Twitters. Uh, uh, Dan Dan Tat on Twitter, yeah. No, yeah. D, D Santat on Twitter. DanTat.com, yes, the website. Yes. And then do follow him on Instagram if you use Instagram. It's DeSantat on Instagram as well. Lots of funny stuff there. So, Dan, thank you very thank much you. for all the awesome stuff that you shared today. Really appreciate it. I love talking with you. So, uh, and Aaron Helmerk, thank you thank very you. much for being here to bring in the book recommendations. And thanks for uh, bringing the hardcover of drama yes. for me to take home tonight. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, everybody go check out Drama Day September 1st that's at GoRaina.com for God's sakes let's put this book on the number one bestseller list on day one if you don't you will make baby jersey cry and nobody wants that so <laughs> so until next time everybody we'll be back on another Wednesday at 12.30pm Eastern Time on TV and on Google Plus thanks to the Ann Arbor District Library for putting on this show every week Matt Dubay Tom Smith and Eric Kloster in the chat appreciate you guys thanks everybody for uh, you know watching live and downloading and listening until next time I have been Jersey Drozd of ComicsAreGreat.com and Jersey on Twitter okay bye and now the credits roll you won't be able to hear us for a second Dan just one second I can hear you oh can you Oh, yeah. cool. Normally when they're rolling the credits, uh, the Skype audio drops out. Uh, okay. Are they hearing us? <laughs> I don't know if they're hearing us in the, in the recording or not.